Okay, you guys, welcome to this week's episode on the podcast. I am very excited for you to hear this conversation today. I feel like I say that every single week, but I genuinely and truly am just so excited for you to hear this conversation with Jen. We talk a lot about a very life tra- like life transformational, life-changing moment for her and her family, which was when her son, very out of the blue, got incredibly sick and it altered their entire life forever. But what she's sharing in today's episode is the power in transforming your mindset and resilience in times that we least expect it. And so there's a lot to learn from Jen's story. And she also talks about relationships. We talk about relationships and how to continue to build strong relationships, even in the hardest moments, even when you feel like you can't move forward anymore. She's such an amazing human being. She is a registered social worker and psychotherapist with over a decade of experience helping individuals and couples improve mindset, developing coping strategies, and increasing self-awareness so that they can improve their lives. She specializes in anxiety and growth mindset and uses evidence-based therapeutic approaches to support her clients in their healing journey. She actually happens to live around me in the greater Toronto area with her husband and their two incredible children. And when she's not working with her clients or public speaking, she enjoys spending time with family and friends, staying active as a form of self-care and dreaming up her next big project. Let's get into this one with Jen. Jen, welcome to the Happiness Happens podcast. I'm so happy to have you here today. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. We're going to have such a lovely conversation because we're going to dive into so many different areas. I say this every time, but honestly, you never know what a conversation is going to be like or how it's going to go. I have an idea of how I want it to go, but I don't exactly know how I want it to go, you know? And so I will ask you my first question. And this is a question that I started asking in the third season of the podcast because I felt like it was a beautiful way to understand happiness on a different level. And so this question is, what does happiness mean to you? Happiness to me is a choice. And sometimes it's a really hard choice and sometimes it's a really easy choice. But the choice for me involves acceptance, confidence, and peace. And to me, that if I have those things going on and I'm able to choose those things, then I'm pretty happy. And that can be applied to so many different areas of my life. I love that so much. And one of the ways that I describe happiness is inner peace. I feel like if you have, like you're saying, if you have inner peace, I feel like you have a really strong backbone to to stand up on because nothing can really shake that place of feeling confident within yourself you know what i mean Absolutely. or feeling yeah. or feeling at peace within yourself but the one thing that i really like that you said that i haven't actually heard in a long time on the podcast is this piece about acceptance what what does that look like to you in your journey we're going to talk about your book the book that you wrote and you know your, your child that had medical crisis, like all the stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, what does acceptance look like in your life? And how did you have to come to that place? Yeah. So acceptance, I start off typically, if I have to describe it even to clients, like acceptance does not mean you like it. So like we have to get out of that idea that when we accept something, it just means like, okay, cool. This is great. Acceptance means acknowledging Mm -hmm. what is and recognizing what is within your control and what's not within your control. And can we let go what's not within our control? And I think when we get to a place of acceptance, it becomes much easier to do that. So oftentimes Mm -hmm. when we're trying desperately to like control things and even in, in, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but in my journey in the beginning, when I was trying to get things back on track, I mean, whatever that means, that was me being in resistance. I just wasn't accepting the fact that this is what the cards we were dealt and we had to yeah. get to a place of that. But acceptance can look really different for different people. And I think it can include, like, sometimes it includes grief. Sometimes it mm. includes, you know, all like all the emotions at one time, right? And it's mm-hmm. it's it's a lot. It's a process. Acceptance is a process. It is. Yeah, it really is a process. So why don't we go there to okay. your your journey and that coming to that place of accept, acceptance? Take us through like the story, because I know you, you wrote a book from your experience as well, which I want to yeah. talk about. But I, I want to hear what those moments look like in, in your in your journey. Yeah. So it all I mean, for me, it all started in 2018. So I'm the mother of two pretty cool kids. That's I'm obviously biased. And they're six and eight now. So when my youngest was seven months old, he went to bed. It was a typical night. It was actually a boring night. And the next morning around 430, he woke up crying. We thought he was teething because he was like of that age. And yeah. it took a while to soothe him, like nor- like longer than it would have normally. 
Yeah. And we, and he ended up falling back asleep. And then a couple hours later, I kept checking on him, but we had, my husband and I had said like, just let him sleep. Cause he was so upset over the night. You know, he's probably exhausted. And when I did go to wake him up because something inside me, like around eight 30, which is later than he would have normally slept in. I just said some, he should be up by now. Something's not right. He was very hard to wake. And so he ended up oh. being really lethargic. Yeah. And after he woke up, his breathing pattern changed. So <gasps> that's so scary. Of course, yeah. So, and I had my oh two-year-old with me, right? So I'm, you know, Anyway, it was it was a traumatic experience and we called or yeah. I called 911. We ended up getting taken to a local emergency room and within minutes the pediatrician had come down and said to me like this is one of three things. It's either uh, meningitis seizures or a stroke and I'm like, okay, well none of those sound good. Um and we took him for a CT scan right away and I, I went to put him from the stretcher that we had kind of like run down the hall with to the the CT bed and I saw a facial droop that wasn't there like three seconds before and I worked on a stroke unit as a social worker uh, years like in, early on in my career and I said oh my god like I think he's had a stroke, had a stroke. Oh my god. yeah and then I waited That's obviously for months. the doctor seven months and no known cause and that's, so that's not typical part- like that's not something that would typically no. happen yeah. So I, I should prep like strokes do happen. I didn't know strokes okay. happened to babies until my baby had one. I didn't even think this was a thing because I worked in geriatrics before. Right. So right. strokes happen in about one in 5,000 births, but typically they're in utero. So they actually happen right. before they're born. It's the main cause wow. of cerebral palsy and his sort of, they call it cryptogenic or medical fluke. I mean, there's a bunch of different terms happen in about yeah. 10% of cases. And then his trajectory, so he's in like one of 50,000. And then his trajectory gets a lot closer to one in a million based on kind of what happened over the next few years. But oh my God. he, uh, yeah, so they, they do happen. He had a blood clot, which occurred and we don't know why. So it just sort of happened and it, it they know uh, took where? over. Like, I mean, it oh, obviously yeah, it would right travel up to... Cerebral. Yeah, the right middle cerebral artery, we don't know where it started. I mean, it could have started wow. anywhere, but yeah, so it, it was the mi- right middle cerebral artery and it took out more than half of the right hemisphere of his brain. Wow. Yeah, so we didn't know, like the first 72 hours, it was hour oh to hour. They to- they wouldn't talk to us. This is where the book title, Making It to Monday, came because this happened on a Friday. And Friday mm-hmm. evening, one of the doctors pulled us into the into their rooms and was telling us about you know, once we get to Monday, once we get to Monday, and I, I kind of asked, like, what What's what happens? Happen? Like, why aren't we talking about Tuesday? And she said, well, he has to make it to Monday. And so for my husband and I, I think we were both taken aback. And, and that yeah. was when I had to ask, like, are we talking, like, is this a, a death? Like, do I need to be plan end of life planning for my child? And she said, if, you know, I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. And for someone yeah. who loves planning, like I'm an anxious oh. person. I've lived with anxiety my whole life. I love a plan. I love a good plan and a backup plan. And to hear that was like knocking the wind out of me. Well, there's no control. Absolutely none. None whatsoever. No none control, whatsoever. especially when you're yeah. anxious. I'm a more anxious person, but I, I don't plan. And I think that adds to my anxiety, but that's fine. It's a different story. But one thing that I've noticed with my anxiety is that I like control. Like I like to control situations yeah. and things and whatever. So to sit in that place and like not being able to control the situation is incredibly impossible. Yeah. So, I I mean, he did survive, which is great. And obviously, yeah. and then it was a long road to recovery. So it was like a week in the ICU, another week in neurology, three months in a rehab hospital in oh Toronto. My gosh. And then we moved back home. And all that time, I mean, I'm away from my daughter. I moved, I lived with him in the hospital, obviously, away from my husband. And so that was, it was just I've never learned so much. I've never gone through a harder experience and I've never learned more about myself or my family Mm. ever. And so we never had a reason why this happened to him. And I went looking for a book when I was in hospital to read. So something that was going to be like authentic and honest about the anguish, the grief, the the confusion, the fear, but then also something that would give me hope that I could kind of look forward to the future. I couldn't find it. And so I had, I had talked with my husband probably a couple months after and I said, I, it, we don't know why this happened. And I think maybe we need to share our story to help other people. Cause I felt alone, but I was like, I can't possibly be the only person feeling alone, going through something unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And that's where making it to Monday actually came from. Wow. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how you manage the relationships, especially I would say with your husband too, because that is a very challenging situation to go through. And I think, mm-hmm. and I'm speaking from experience a little bit, not with my own self, but within my family, you know, mm-hmm. one of my family members was very sick growing up and my parents separated 
And I think that a lot of the times that becomes a typical story yeah. of, you know, there's, it, it's very challenging to, to navigate something like that. It's like, you know, and especially moving away from home, him having yeah. to care for your daughter, like that's a lot of change. And so how did you start to navigate together that relationship and find that place and come back to each other? That's hard. We, yeah, it, it was. And it's happened like more than once too, right? So we have, not that we get used to it because it's never, never get used to it, but I'm a therapist by nature. So my, mm-hmm. my role, I'm a registered social worker and a psychotherapist. So my poor husband can't really get out of talking because I'm a big communicator. So <laughs> bless him because he's open to that. But I think what was a real challenge was we had to acknowledge that it sucked. Like there, this yeah. is that acceptance piece is getting back to the place. Like we didn't have any control over this. I was not about to leave my child and he wasn't about to, you know, want me to either. Right, and right, so it was about how do we acknowledge this and identify that we recognize this season is really, really hard. And we kept talking about it. It was temporary. And so one thing that really helped me through that in particular with the relationships was this is going to be okay. Or I'm going to be okay, even if this is not okay. And then I applied that to we. Wow. Like we're going to be okay, even if this is not okay. And it's not lost on us. We had a lot of candid conversations. I mean, with an, with an ICU admission or uh, any type of special needs, like my son now lives with permanent disabilities, the, the divorce rate's incredibly high. And yeah. that makes sense because people cope in different ways. They're on different journeys. And even, you know, I write about it in the book, but Paul, my husband's Paul, we talk about it all the time. Like our experience, even though it was the same event, are vastly different. Yeah. of how that went down. And yeah. it was a lot for us to get to a place where we respected those differences. Like I'll never understand what he went through. And he acknowledges that he'll never understand what I went through. And so I think in my mind, the other piece around what's helped our our relationship anyway, is around recognizing that we play on the same team, but we play vastly different positions. And that's mm. a beautiful thing because you don't want a team yeah. of pitchers. Right. It's not helpful. Right? So, right. so that's been helpful. But I, I do think acknowledging and accepting like sometimes stuff sucks and and there's not a lot we can do about it except acknowledge that it sucks and have a reminder that we need to make an effort to get back to each other at some point. Yeah. And then we I did. think that's then really we, key. You know. I think yeah. that's really, really key because honestly, I, I think that a lot of the times – I don't want to say people give up because I don't think that's the right term. But I think sometimes people just don't know how to communicate – And I think that communication builds resentment. You know what I mean? And you're lucky that your husband communicates because it's not always the case. And sometimes that ends in scenarios that you never thought that you would be in. You know what I mean? And it sounds silly, you know, to have that be a reason why something would end. You know what I mean? Like just communication. But it's like the biggest piece of everything that we do. And if you can't do that one thing, you got nothing. You know what I mean? Because like being so far apart from each other. Without communication, how can you possibly expect to align back back together? Yeah. Yeah. It is also about translating too, right? Because we communicate differently, Mm -hmm. right? Our love languages are different. How we communicate, even even the resentment that you speak about, like that existed a hundred percent. I mean, I was stuck. I was, I use air quotes. I'm I was stuck at home. I gave up my career temporarily Mm -hmm. because I had to care give for my children. And so, but my husband had to go back to work. So even while we were still in hospital, he went back to work because somebody had to. And that was our reality. And over time, what ended up happening was I would get resentful because yeah. he got to go and talk to adults and like go in the car. And, yeah. you know, like if he wanted to stop at the store on the way home by himself, he could do that or listen to music. He could do that. And it was mm. important, I think, for me to keep myself in check and recognize that it's OK for me to talk about this. But I can't like the resentment was mine. It wasn't his. Right. So if That's I'm resenting him, I hold that and I have to do something with it. And that again, is a little bit about acceptance, but also about getting comfortable with looking in the mirror when maybe we mm-hmm. don't want to. And that was a big learning for me. That's I can't so speak true. for my husband, but that was for me. That's honestly, that's amazing. That uh, Honestly, it's really amazing that you guys were able to come back together because I think that situations in life, you either get stronger together or you just don't, you know what I mean? And I don't think there's any yeah. shame in either of them no. because sometimes things happen and it just is what it is, you know? But I think that this is a really beautiful way that you guys are able to come together and support both of your children. And especially knowing that you have like a journey ahead of you, a journey that you definitely didn't anticipate, right? <laughs> it's one thing I think for your, you know, your child or to like know when your child like is before your child is born that there might be something that, you you know what I mean? Like you Mm -hmm. don't, like Mm -hmm. sometimes you get, they get diagnosed with different things. You didn't, it was not 
wasn't a thing. You know what I mean? So like at seven months, just to have that completely change and that complete yeah. shift, that's a really – like your whole life changes. It does. And it's it's interesting you say that, Simona, because I think sometimes too, wh- whether we have kids or not, I think can be applied, but I'll use the kids because we're, we're talking about my children. But I think when we have children, we sometimes have this idea of the path they're going to go down. Like we have this sort of vision of we see the milestones, right? We see the graduation or they have this personality. They'd be great in this profession yeah. or maybe they'll go to this school or whatever. And so we do that with ourselves too, of course. But I sure. think what ends up happening in, in our case and with a lot of parents of, of kids or even partners who have had medical crises is all of a sudden something comes along and just smashes through that path. Yeah. And now the path is gone and you're going, yeah. oh, where, where do I go? I don't know where I'm going. And this is terrifying until we recognize that that path was never actually there in the first place. We just thought it was. Mm-hmm. We actually have to accept the fact that we, we create the path, but we do it one step at a time. Right. I'm not the same person I was five years ago and I'm not going to be the same person in five years from now because we're always learning and growing. And I have to get comfortable with trusting the process one step at a time and, exactly. and getting comfortable doing things scared. There's been no better teacher than than trauma and there's no better time to learn than a crisis. Right. There's no better classroom than mm-hmm. a crisis if we choose to do the learning. I think sometimes we're not ready and that's OK because readiness is like critical with when it comes to change. Well, that's such a big piece as well. And how did you start to – okay, obviously your mindset is very – I want to say – I want to use the word positive, but almost – I don't think positive is the right word. Like, I mean, it is. You have a positive mindset, but like your mindset is very – I don't want to say like re- – it's like realistic mixed with positive mindset, mixed yeah. with you know acceptance and – just like yep. a, a deeper knowing. But so how do you even begin to get to that place? So you're making it to Monday, okay? And yep. you're in this like chaos crisis situation that you never imagined that you would ever be in. Yep. How? Like one or two one or two tips for my listener right now so that they can, you know, because we're all faced with hard things in life, different scales, different, you know, different types of hard things. But How? So I'll say two things. One, I wasn't always like this. This took this took a lot of like self work, and so right. I had to get myself a therapist. When I when everything went down that initial like twenty January twenty eighteen, I went into hardcore crisis doer mode. Mm. So I was the one like making the list, delegating, writing things down. I'm going to be this like you know I just did the swan dive into parenting and and caregiving, and so the biggest learning was I have to take care of myself or I can take care of no one. Right. And that meant my mental health, that meant therapy, that meant regular exercise for me. Everybody's going to find mm-hmm. the things that work for them. But mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, it's funny you mentioned that I have this, like, I, I call myself a realistic optimist. Huh. So I, I yeah. like to be well, optimistic. It's legit because I, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that I you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's important to be optimistic, but we can't ignore the fact that there's fear and anxiety and uncertainties in life. And so I try to do both at the same time. And actually in doing that, the biggest piece of learning for me was validation and the Mm. difference between validating ourselves and wallowing, right? It's okay to sit there and say like, this is awful and I don't like this and this is hard and I'm struggling. And I also trust that I have the tools to get through it. Those things don't have to be exclusive from each other. I can also be grateful for the support that I have and my skill set and knowledge and perseverance, whatever, and be exhausted and terrified and frustrated. And so that sort of dichotomy or plurality of truth type of thing, that sort of mentality has been really helpful in terms of recognizing that it doesn't have to be this or that. There's a, a huge array in between if we're open I to love it. that. I love that differentiation because I think sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, I can only be happy if this, or I can only be at peace yeah. if this. But it's not that. You, you know what I mean? Like you no. can find joy in hard moments because it is a choice. Like you were saying before, it is a choice to show up with whatever with whatever mentality you have, with whatever mindset you have or how you want to step into that day. And it doesn't mean that things are not hard. But I think too, right. something that I face a lot in my own life, and you tell me if you've ever faced this in yours, but I'm a pretty positive person. Like I can look on the bright side of most things, even in really hard moments. And what I've noticed, especially lately, is that comes across almost as like, I don't care or that I'm not sad or that I'm not grieving or that I'm not processing. And I found, I've always found that really interesting because it's like, but if you're going through this really hard thing, how can you possibly be positive or happy or this or that? But life doesn't stop, you know? Right, right. 
That's yeah. the choice you're making. That's a beautiful yeah. example of you making that choice to say that. So I say this to people all the time because I used to hear this and, and I'm sure if you've gone through challenge, people say this too, or I don't know how you do it. Yeah. I don't know how you do it. Jen, you're the strongest person. Like it, they're, they're saying it out of kindness. It's lovely things to say. And yeah. My response used to be, well, I don't have a choice. And then I realized through my own work and self-discovery, no, I absolutely have a choice. I could sit in the corner and cry yeah. or I can choose to find the joy in my day, which sometimes takes a great deal of effort to find the tiniest little joys. And sometimes it yeah. doesn't. And what this experience over those three years was really around and continues was it was only through the darkness that I was able to appreciate light. Mm. And so if you think about Roger Center, I call it Sky Dome still, but like if you're yes, in there like and yeah, and the lights are off, right? Say it's empty and you're sitting in there, the dome's closed, lights are off, it's pitch black. If someone lights a match on the other side of that stadium, you're going to see it. Yeah. Not going to be a huge amount of light, but you're going to see it. But if the lights are on, the dome's open and it's daytime, you'd have no clue. So how can we not appreciate like darkness does a lot for us in terms of allowing us to appreciate light because it doesn't take mm. much to see. Mm -hmm. But that is also, again, the way that we look at it. So it's a choice. I, yeah, I think it's a choice. But I, I also think too, people can have their own interpretations of things. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a huge, how do I say this, opportunity, even for you when you're saying people can say, you know, how can you not care? Or like, you know, how can you be happy during a difficult time? That they don't, again, they don't have to exist exclusively. And so I tend to be very open around like, oh, this is very difficult. And, you know, I'm struggling with this. And I'm really grateful for that. I try to add the words and a lot instead yes. of but. Yes. And okay. that seems to be helpful. But it, it I just did it. <laughs> but I think there's always going to be some people that don't understand. And in a way, it's okay, because they don't have that lived experience. And to be quite honest, I don't, I don't want them to have that lived experience, because it was awful. Exactly. Because then that means that they had to go through something. So you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And But at the same time, and at the same time, I think we all have our teachers in life. You know what I mean? We all yeah. have things in life that situations that we never would have imagined, things that we sure. never anticipated we would be there. You know what I mean? And I think that life is at the end of the day, it's a journey because, and I try and do this often. I try and like zoom out. When you really think yes. about it, we're literally on a spinning globe. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Right. In the middle of nowhere. Like honestly. And it yes. helps you take the drama out of the situation that you're in and not drama in a bad way, but just drama in general, because it's like, yep, I'm literally on a spinning globe and it is what it is. And eventually we'll get off this ride. And you know what I mean? It's like, so how do you make it the best possible time while you're here, regardless of what you have going on in your life? And it's not to like gaslight your own self and say like, you know, every moment sure. has to be happy and positive and this and that. That's not true. No. But there is a way to find joy even in sadness and I really do believe that and I think that I've learned that through this whole journey especially having this podcast you're right it is not mutually exclusive it's not this or that yeah and sometimes too like there isn't meant to be joy in a specific moment but there is learning right. and we can be grateful like I always think there can be gratitude for things yeah. and and so that's been helpful for me gratitude practice is like the number one thing I tell people to practice when they're wanting to improve mindset or decrease anxiety or improve mood is three things you're grateful for from this day. Mm -hmm. And they need to be like super specific and small. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful that I got my coffee warm this morning and I got to drink the whole thing before it got cold. Uh, Cause normally that doesn't happen. Right. I get distracted. You know, I can be grateful for, I made it to work on time when I thought I was going to be late. I'm grateful on a really hard day. I'm grateful the day is over and I'd never have to do that day again. Yeah. Right. Yes, Those are things that we, we're not making it up. We're just putting a magnifying glass over the things that we would have glossed over because we're too busy thinking about other things. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. sometimes helpful. And the zooming out, I, I have to say, I, one thing I practice that I love, which is similar, is I'll ask myself, like, how much is this going to matter five months from now or five years from now? And if it's totally. not that much, do I need to spend this much energy on it right now? Or even five days and five hours. You know what I mean? Yeah, like really, if, if, for sure. like yesterday, I was sitting in something yesterday and I was just so frustrated and I was so annoyed. And I was thinking to myself, one of my friends was like, okay, but like, are you okay? Is everything okay? I'm like, it's literally fine. Like it's not right now, but it will be in about five hours. So it's like really not even worth going into because mm -hmm. we get to choose if we want to take our energy now and put it deeper into something and, yeah. and manifest and create a flame behind whatever emotion. Like that's a choice at the end of the day. Where do yeah. you want to put the energy into? Do you want to put the energy into the drama and the gossip and the this and the that and the shame and the guilt and the spiral? Or do you want to take that and maybe redirect it a little bit and be like, okay, this really sucks. But like, there's another option. There's another opportunity, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about your book. So you wrote your book okay. based yep. off of this experience that you went through in life. Yes. It started off as my journal. Did it? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, I didn't want that. to forget what was happening because I knew, I knew I was in the midst of trauma and I went, I'm not going to remember this. And I started writing it down every day. Wow. And I also had time. I mean, I was watching, my son was unconscious for several days. I mean, I started to write yeah. down how I was feeling. So that's how it started. And then a few months later, I, I started to put it into a narrative and it took a long time. I yeah. thought the book was done in 2019. I thought the book was finished. And then 2020 happened with my son. And my husband was like, either you're making a second book or this book's not finished. And I went, I don't think it's done yet. It's not, it's and, not done yeah. yet. This is only part one. Yeah, what happened in 2020 with your son? Uh, so about a month into the pandemic, so Dominic had been stable. He did develop epilepsy as part of mm. his a, a consequence of the stroke. That's not uncommon with pediatric stroke. So yeah. he'd been stable for a long time. And then April 2020, uh, he started having uncontrollable seizures. And so no medication was helping. It was it went from one a day to like 35 a day. And it was oh only when he was sleeping, he was okay. And so he had to have a bunch of testing done and all of that. And they started to recommend a, a surgery called a functional hemispherectomy. And they actually mm. detached half his brain in November of 2020. So that meant more disability, more hospital stay, another stint in rehab. So we did this all over again. Only this time I had the opportunity, I suppose, and the yeah. benefit of being able to prepare. Right. Because you knew it was so coming. It, and it was coming. Right, the, the stroke was a complete shock. But this time I had like familiarity with neurology at least and, and sick kids and Holland Blurview and all that stuff. And so I tried to prepare and I also, I think was in a different place mentally. So, I mean, I had been set up with a therapist. I knew what I needed to do for self-care yeah. in order to be able to make this happen. And I stopped resisting the, the suck. Yeah. Okay. Just, you know, I acknowledge like, I don't want to do this, but I have, I'm okay. going to do it and it's going to exactly. be okay. <laughs> so no, was, that yeah. second, that second, like, incident, or it, it, I'm going to call it an incident, like that second point in November, was that something that became permanent afterwards? Or like, was there any reversing that it was? Okay. No, no, it's permanent. Yeah. So oh, it, wow. it's detached electrically. So they can do it two ways. They can remove an anatomical hemispherectomy where they physically remove the hemisphere. This one is functional. So they detach the electrical connections every single one. It's an eight hour surgery. It's quite long. And wow. so blood flow continues. It's actually remarkable what medicine can do. So his right hemisphere continues to seize. That, that won't stop. He'll continue to have seizures probably the rest of his life with some break. But if this if the surgery is successful, then those seizures have nowhere to communicate because right. it's not, it's just seizing on itself. Oh. The downfall of that is any healthy tissue that was left in that brain is now unusable. So that was the difficult decision oh. that we had to make. But it was unanimously supported by the physicians and the team. And frankly, it was the only chance of giving him some sort of stability in terms of That's life, right. which I, I value for quality for him. Of course. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. also, you know, I'm, I'm speaking very much out of like, you know, no experience in this at all, but I can only imagine that, you know, even if there were healthy tissues at some point, there probably wouldn't be, you know what I mean? And so well, like, yes, if they're pervasive, the seizures are pervasive. Or, it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like his, his development had basically stalled at one point because the seizures were, oh, sorry, the seizures were happening so much that he was just so fatigued. He, he couldn't do, you know, imagine the chatter going on in the brain. It can't really do oh, much yeah. development if it's just trying to stay afloat. So yeah. it didn't seem like it was interesting. It was an impossible decision and yet was also a really it seemed like Realistic a really straightforward one. decision as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost and so, like yeah. the, you know, in your mind that it's like what the quote unquote right decision is or the, the best decision for him. And then also there's like that grieving piece too of like, oh my God, again, you know what I mean? Yeah. Again, this like normalcy quote unquote, what even is normal, but like, you know, the, all the things that you thought that he would do in his life. Yeah. And it's like that whole grieving process again. So is that something that, you know, if someone's going through this right now or something similar or like not even maybe not even on the mm -hmm. same scale but just a really hard moment is that something that my listener could get from your book yes that's yeah. why i wrote it i didn't write it for those well i mean those that have experience with stroke yeah for sure you're going to hear a lot of similarities but this book was written for people going through times of uncertainty and times of challenge and it's meant to validate and identify what those emotions are. So I've been really blessed, like a lot of parents and caregivers and adults without kids, but that have partners or they themselves have gone through crisis, have reached out and it, it never ceases to amaze me. Like our journeys are so different, but the emotions are often really the, the same. Similar. And so I get yeah. a lot of that feedback, which is, you know, honestly, that's why I wrote it. I wrote it because I said, I wish I had it when yeah. I was going through it. And so I was hoping that it would be that for someone else. And I think, I think we don't talk enough about 
the strength and vulnerability and the importance of being able to say that we feel it all and it's not all good and that's okay because it's it's not about success or failure it's like success or learning right and this was a this was a period of learning it was hard it was it was a, it was awful but it was also really important for who i am today and who my I kids are that. I love that. What a beautiful yeah. gift. Where can our list? I have one more question for you yeah. to close out the episode, but I want to know first, where can our listeners find you and where can they get your book? So they can find me two ways. So I'm at making it to Monday on Instagram or professionally, they can find me at nourish soul therapy.com. And my book's available Indigo chapters, Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. And my last question for you today, Jen, is what's something that someone can do to create a little more happiness in their day every day starting today? Gratitude practice. Three mm -hmm. things you're grateful for at the end of the day that happened today. Do you and have to write them out or is it enough to just say it in your mind? Ideally, you're writing them out, but I'm not, I'm not a stickler. So I, <laughs> as long as it gets done, it does. I, I, this is the thing. It doesn't need to look pretty. Yeah, it just needs to get done. done. And it That's needs right. to get done for at least three weeks. Minimum oh. takes three weeks to build a habit. So if you want to start changing your mindset, it starts with that. And it starts with at least three weeks. And I, I think it has to include self-compassion. Mm. I know that's, that's kind of too. But yeah. No, no, no. I love that. I think self-compassion is a big one. It's something that I'm learning for sure. Mm -hmm. oh, Jen, thank you so much for, for being here today and for sharing your story with us. Thanks for having me. This was really nice. It was so nice. And thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Happiness Happens podcast. Be sure to connect with both of us on social media. Let us know that you're listening. Take a screenshot of this conversation, of you listening to this conversation and tag us so that we know that you're here. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here, for tuning in. And remember that happiness happens when you're least expecting it.